Intel finally released a brand new architecture. Arrow Lake is here and they are promising better multi-threaded performance, better single core performance, way better efficiency, but yet worse gaming performance. On the outside, Intel Arrow Lake looked amazing. Those leaks looked super cool. I was thinking, oh, like this is finally gonna kill AMD. You know, Zen 5 wasn't very impressive, literally 5%, but then you get Arrow Lake and it's like negative 5%. What? I've been tuning Arrow Lake for about the past 24 hours as of right now. And let's just say there are a lot of things I really do like about Arrow Lake. And there are a lot of things that I hate. Intel finally did something that I've been wanting them to do for literally years. And that is remove hyperthreading. They ditched it. They said we no longer need it because for them it's more of an efficiency thing and it's going to help with their efficiency and their thermals that is one of the reasons why i actually did use to disable it it lowered my temperatures but that just meant i had more temperature headroom to overclock but it really does help actually with gaming performance just because then you're not having to worry about windows properly scheduling tasks we'll get more into that later as well the other main thing that I really did like about Arrow Lake is that they are officially supporting 6400 megahertz RAM. Before this, on something like the 14900K, you're getting about 5200 megahertz versus with this, you're getting 6400 megahertz. I know, I know. Everyone on this channel who's probably gonna watch this channel though is gonna be running way higher memory speeds, at least 7000 plus. But look, a lot of people wanna stay in spec and them getting higher frequencies is a benefit. The only drawback is that this is only officially supported with the CKD modules, the CU DIMMs, with that correction on it, but those are super expensive. Those aren't out yet. Now, you may have noticed from the title and from this box right here, this box has a seven on it. Typically, I am a big fan of getting the highest end SKU, which would be the 285K, the Ultra 9. This is an Ultra 7 265K. On launch day, I drove to Micro Center over an hour and a half away so that I could pick this up for you guys on launch day. And when I got there, I was the first one. I was loading in line probably 20 minutes before they opened. I walk in and I go, all right, where are the 285Ks? They go, we don't have any. I'm like, what? I was very genuinely confused because they said they were gonna have them in stock and I was confused. They said that no micro centers in the country had 285Ks on launch day and that is confirmed through other people in my discord as well and people messaging me on twitter there were zero available on launch day i couldn't even order one on amazon or best buy or b and h i couldn't order one anywhere so i think there's something up maybe the yields aren't very high on the 285k they're trying to hit 5.7 cores which seems very very much like a stretch especially because this isn't their own node they're on tsmc's node now so i just decided that i'm gonna get the best processor that I can get at the time, which is the 265K. This is the i7 equivalent. This kind of brings me back to the last time when I picked up an i7, which was the 12700K. And this one has very similar characteristics in my opinion. It kind of has that ultra nine characteristics, I believe, while still being kind of very much cheaper. My 12700K did amazing. It does 5.2 on the P cores. It was beating 12900Ks in games. It had a very good memory controller. That kind of, that made me honestly more excited to overclock it once I started using this chip. Because I have a Z890 Apex, this has Asus's SP feature, and I have an SP90, which seems fairly decent. You want to be in between 90 and 100, and being uh, Ultra 7, I didn't expect to be kind of over 90. My P cores were at 96 though, which seems very good. MCSP was 61, which seems to be actually above average. I know the number isn't very high, but I was talking to people who have like SP50s and like they have a good IMC as well. So it looks like the IMC isn't gonna be holding you back on this generation of CPUs, which is a good thing. So like I just mentioned, for testing this platform, we'll be using the Z890 Apex. This motherboard is literally one of my favorite motherboards. And if this motherboard was available on a Z790, I would 100% purchase it. Some things I like are the IO, you have plenty of USB on it. You don't have to worry about having enough USB A's. You also have USB C and Thunderbolt. The Thunderbolt finally allows us, and finally Asus did it. They gave us iGPU on an Apex. That means that no longer will I have to worry about having a GPU installed if I want to test things. But it's over 
Thunderbolt DisplayPort. So really, it isn't all the way there. Asus, you were so close. Just give us an HDMI port. Just let it only do 4K60. I don't care. Make an HDMI 2.0. Give us a display port. Give us some like normal port that we can just plug into. You have no idea how amazing overclockers. I don't know why for as an overclocking board, you don't have that available. If you fail a BIOS flash on a GPU or you brick your GPU, the amount of times that has saved me an iGPU on my motherboard, it's almost a non-negotiable for me. Also, I really did like that the BIOS is actually 4K. It's super duper clear. I have a 32 inch OLED behind me. And most of the time when I am actually in BIOS, it just doesn't look good. It's like 1080p, it's really stretched. And when you're trying to read text, it's just not that clear. As well as also just some nice to have, such as the easy removal M.2 and PCIe slots, which means that I don't really have to screw in an M.2 anymore. I just plop it in and put the heatsink back on. Super nice feature. I hate M.2 screws. And then the PCIe one isn't that big of a deal for me, but I get it if you have a really, really thick GPU. It can be hard to sometimes put something in or put your finger in to actually remove the PCIe slot. I remember on my Z690 Dark, they literally came with a long stick they called the PCIe release latch. I will be having a full video of overclocking Aero Lake and just more of kind of going in depth on it, as well as the Z890 Apex coming in a later video very soon. The main selling point of an Apex though is just its overclocking performance. It has two DIMMs, you can only have two RAM slots, 96 gigabytes max of RAM. So what was I able to actually achieve on this? I was able to achieve with my 2x24 sticks, 8866 megahertz at CL38. Madness actually did help me out in my Discord. I'll leave a link down below to his Twitter. He's a super awesome dude, and he kind of gave me some, I, some help so that I can uh, get a little bit better performance for you guys. I was able to achieve 141 gigabytes a second in bandwidth and 72 nanoseconds of latency running Intel memory latency checker, which seems amazing the rest of the cpu is clocked to 5.5 gigahertz on the p cores which is an amazing p core bin by the way most 285ks are kind of hitting at that range too kind of feels like it's my 12700k again the e cores are running at 5 gigahertz which is a massive up boost in frequency compared to previous intel e cores the ring is running at 4 gigahertz so the ring did definitely take a decline in frequency for example on my 1400k s you can run about like 4.8 4.9 5 gigahertz possibly there's also two different interconnect frequencies called the d2d or the die to die which kind of interconnects the different chiplets and tiles of the cpu because it is no longer monolithic there are different tiles for different parts of the cpu and this does interconnect it and that is running at 3.8 gigahertz there's also the ngu frequency which I'm running at 3.4 gigahertz which is another interconnect. These last two voltages are critical to having low latency especially in memory because these do cause the interconnect and the slower that they are because these are running in the 2 gigahertz by stock that actually does significantly affect latency in a negative way where increasing them and making sure that they are stable which I did. I was 100 making sure that everything that I'm running in this is something that I would recommend to anyone watching this video as well as 100% stable. Looking at the other two platforms that I'm using to test, my 1400KS is a direct die CPU running at 5.7 P cores, 4.5 on the E cores and 4.9 on the ring. The reason why I am only running 5.7 on the P cores for my KS is just because the voltage required past that is not really worth it, as well as also the CPU is so fast and it doesn't really scale. So this is still gonna give very high representative results for you guys. On my Z790i Lightning, I was able to achieve 8400 CL38 with two by 24 gigabytes of RAM, which achieved me 128 gigabytes a second of bandwidth with 57.5 nanoseconds of latency. The 7000X3D is using the Gigabyte B650 Gaming AX V2. It's not my favorite board, but it does get the job done. And I'm running 2 by 16 ADI at 6000 CL30 and 2033 on the FCOK. The CPU is fully PBO tuned and all of that. The RAM was able to achieve 64 gigabytes a second of bandwidth and 71.5 nanoseconds of latency. If you don't really know much about different platforms, bandwidth and latency, these are not directly comparable but this is something that if you do have one of these platforms and you run Intel Memory Latency Checker, you can kind of get more of a comparison on where my RAM and full frequency does stack up compared to yours, which is why I gave you this information. If you enjoy this kind of content and you want me to continue trying to get these videos out as fast as possible on launch day, I did not get any samples. This was purchased with my own money. 
please support me using the Discord. Join the Discord, that'll be a perfect place to support me. You're gonna get so many different things. I'm working on things for you guys. You get to chat with me directly as well, as well as subscribing and liking down below will help me as well, possibly get samples in the future so I can overclock these CPUs for you guys, get them out on launch day, get that highest performance. It's been a long week trying to benchmark the 1400KS and the 700X3D, as well as then tuning and benchmarking this platform. I've loved it, it's been an amazing experience. It's so much fun for me, but just so that I can continue doing this for you guys, make sure that you guys are supporting me. Really do appreciate it. As well as just use the affiliate links down below for the products that I'm gonna be uh, listing. For the rest of it, the 4090 was what I used as my graphics card. It runs at three gigahertz plus 1000 on the VRAM with a Asus XOC BIOS on it so that it gives you the highest performance and we are trying to remove as much of a GPU bottleneck as possible. For Windows, we used a clean install on both the 1400KS and the 700X3D for 24H2, which is the latest Windows version. It was announced that before actually I got the CPU, there is an insider build of Windows that has a brand new Arrow Lake scheduler, which properly fixes some things, which just don't really work that well. This CPU is very weird and it has a weird layout and hardware info, Cat Frame X, as well as Task Manager, and as well Windows. Windows needs a specific scheduler that is not out to the public, so it is only available through the Insider channel. That means that during my Arrow Lake testing to give it the best possible chance of winning and showing its proper performance, I use the Insider build. I'm not a fan of using Insider builds, but the fact that it was gonna give me the most accurate results for you guys, I chose to use it and it does properly work. As you can see, running something like Overwatch 2, you can see that it is literally just pinning to the P cores and those E cores are getting ignored. Something that I am super happy to see that there is a fix coming, but I wish it was coming out on day one in the public Windows channel. Like seriously, why did they release this chip and so many things are unfinished? Like the micro code that this board launched with sucked by the way. I had to update the BIOS for it to properly even boot into Windows. It doesn't support two by 16 ADAT. I'm not gonna get really into this. We'll, we'll talk about this later. Let's just talk about the benchmarks. Looking at Cinebench R23, this is something that Intel kind of touted as like, a big deal, they're winning Cinebench, and they are. I mean, this CPU has 20 cores on it, and it is beating my 1400KS with hyper-threading off. It's obviously beating the 700X3D, that only has eight cores and 16 threads, and it is not really a productivity CPU, it's a gaming CPU, so we're not gonna hold that against AMD at all. Also, it's only 8% behind my 1400KS, which has 24 cores, so four more cores, as well as 12 more threads, which is honestly very impressive. Like, good job, Intel. Like, for productivity, you're doing pretty good. Single core is also 5% ahead of my 14900KS. Shadow of the Tomb Raider is run at 1080p low, and this is an AMD kind of bias thing. It loves that cache, it can fit in the cache, and that really does boost that FPS, which shows why the 700X3D is so far ahead. I mean, look, it's 80 FPS higher, but you know. The 265K losing by that much to the 1400KS is really where I'm seeing the issues. Losing by 12% in averages is embarrassing. Like This is not something that Intel should be proud of. Intel shouldn't be releasing this. Cyberpunk 2077, this was actually in 4K, but using the Ultra Preset with no ray tracing and DLSS performance, which does render in 1080p. Um, I like to do this because it kind of shows that if you're playing these single player games, these story games, what is the CPU performance gonna look like when upscaling? This is actually the only time the 265K came out ahead. So like, good job, which was very interesting because there were some leaks on Twitter coming out that showed that this game specifically sucked. So that's Windows update probably did fix it. Tuning probably fixed it. It's probably me, you know, you know how it is. But they're also basically the same. They're within a couple FPS of each other. So I'm not really gonna say this is a full out win. I'm gonna call this a tie the gaming experience is gonna be the exact same. And in competitive gaming, it's not just the FPS that you see on the counter that matters, it's the latency itself. Using FrameView, I checked the PC input latency on Valorant and Overwatch 2. Overwatch 2 with a 600 FPS cap put the 265K in between the 1400KS and the 700X3D for input latency. But look, this really isn't gonna matter. Are you gonna? become a way better gamer by 0.03 milliseconds? No, absolutely not. This is kind of just showing that these CPUs in a competitive title are going to perform the same. 
Valorant does show a little bit different though, with the 265K being 0.3 milliseconds slower. Is that a lot? No. Can you really tell the difference between 0.3 milliseconds? No, but it is something that I did notice and it's something that is probably not gonna be the most optimal for an eSports Pro. Call of Duty Modern Warfare 3 in the benchmark showed average FPS to be about the same with the 265K getting similar averages to the 7800X3D, but worse lows than AMD. AMD is the king of having bad lows and somehow you just took that throne. Looking into CPU FPS on the benchmark though, you see that the 265K is losing by 25% to the 7800X3D. A CPU that came out a year and a half ago is beating, <laughs> I'm not joking, beating a CPU that just came out by 25%. Honestly embarrassing. 13% by the 14900KS. <sighs> like, this is the worst showing, I think, of the 265K is in Call of Duty. A massive game that a lot of people are playing that people really want to see high performance in. Arguably, the CPU is the most important in this game. But in Call of Duty, I also did decide to check out Power Draw. I went into a private match, ran around in a circle. Compared to the 14900KS, yeah, it does pull less power, but it only pulls about 25 watts less in total system power. That is what I am measuring on my UPS. There's nothing else connected other than the computers. And then you're getting about the same FPS as a 7800X3D, which is pulling 380 watts on average, which really does make Intel's efficiency claims seem pointless and honestly embarrassing. I did have to leave out one benchmark though, and that is Fortnite. There was actually an issue with Arrow Lake. So shocker, shocker. But I did have to leave it out because Easy Anti-Cheat is not working properly with Arrow Lake. The game wouldn't even launch or it would crash the PC. So I am apologize for that, but I think we know how it would perform. In conclusion, this platform is actually pretty fun to overclock. It isn't like a headache like I feel like Raptor Lake is where it's you're trying to push everything to the edge so hard. These instabilities didn't really pop out with the Z890 Apex and the improved memory controller though. Also, it's going to be fast for production, so if you are doing these productive tasks and then gaming is kind of secondary, it's like a gaming at night kind of thing, this might be a good CPU for you. But if you are just gaming, honestly, I can't believe I'm saying this, but just buy a 7800X3D, it's going to be faster, it's just going to be more efficient as well. If you want something pure productivity, look at something like a 9950X, buy a used 1400KS. Buying a used last gen CPU looks like it's gonna be the best bang for your buck though, and you're still gonna be getting insane productivity. Unless you need like multiple PCIe Gen 5 drives and that is your workload, which I don't really know what that would be and I don't think most people are, this generation is honestly a skip. Hopefully in the future it can be improved, but I wouldn't hold my breath on that. Maybe new CPUs coming to this platform will be good, it would make you have a reason to actually keep these motherboards. But for most people, I just say, just avoid this. I'm gonna leave affiliate links down below to these CPUs that I tested today. Let me know down below in the comments what your thoughts are. But if you guys have enjoyed, hit the like button down below, subscribe if you haven't already, and I'll see you guys later. Peace.